I, I, I might let me comment about Victor. Victor is a, I've never heard of his last name. I've never heard of his last name, but he's, uh, he goes to the Pentecostal church out in the country, back of, back of Rome, uh, and uh, they have a Baptist preacher preaching in a Pentecostal church, which to me is almost uh, oxymoron. But uh, he is a very sweet guy. And he, he is quite concerned. Uh, he was telling me the other day that when he was 26 years of age, the brakeman on a train, and he was the engineer, uh, forgot to do something. And as a result, there was a train accident which caused him to be injured for the rest of his life. That's why he's in therapy right now. He's in his 60s. But he's come up now with this kidney stone, and they tell him that they're going to try to crush it. If they don't crush it, they're going to have to do surgery. And he, that's why he's asked for prayers. You know, as we think about the last week of the ministry of Jesus Christ, which was called the Passion Week, I think we, we read, it's a familiar word to every one of us. I think we all can identify things, and, but there are different themes that I think we can pick up on. If you recall, last Sunday morning I talked a little bit about those things that were borrowed uh, during the, that particular week. The, uh, borrowed donkey, the borrowed uh, room, the upper room, and the uh, borrowed grave. This morning, I, I, I don't want to get back to the basics of it. Uh, I, I want us to think about some of the things that are very, very important as far as that concer is concerned. Uh, I'm not sure how long I'm going to be preaching this morning. Uh, they're, they're really working me hard in my therapy. And uh, I was telling somebody this morning that I woke up at 3 o'clock with pain in my uh, back and my uh, arm at the point I did, could not go back to sleep. In fact, I sat on the edge of the bed most of the rest of that night. So uh, that was just uh, I'll let you know that I am in uh, some pain today. I told Mike that his pain was caused by old age. I guess my pain is caused by old age, too. But uh, as, you, as you think about this last week of the ministry of Jesus Christ, one of the things that I talk about many, many times in the sermons I preach uh, is based upon hope. Uh, you can find different hopes all, all the way through uh, that week of Jesus. Uh, you can take those that are trying to get, get find fault with him. They had a hope that they could find fault, but never did find fault. Uh, you find when Jesus came into Jerusalem that the people there were hoping for a, uh, him to take uh, set up a kingdom. And it is for him to be the king and set up a Jewish nation as the ruling nation of the world. Uh, that was not to be. Uh, you find that uh, the mother of James and John we're looking for them to have a special place in the uh, kingdom of God. Uh, and she went to Jesus and asked for that to be done. Her hope was wrong. Uh, but Jesus had the hope when he prayed in the 17th chapter of the Gospel of John that, that the people there were, might be united. Uh, I pray for them that they might be one as you, you and I are one as uh, Jesus uh, prayed to the Father. But as you think about it, there was a hope, our hope, as we think back on the Christmas days. Now, I, I'm going to be dealing with some of the basics today. Uh, and I hope to end with one of the things that's very important to me. If I have four letter words, and the only letter that is changed in the three words that I have chosen is the first letter. As you look back over that particular time, there is a, a need expressed for Jesus to come to the world. Uh, I'm going to read some scriptures in that relationship. In uh, Romans, the fifth chapter, the sixth verse, and following, For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. 
For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet for a venture for a good man some would even dare to die. That God commended his love towards us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being thou justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. <coughs> wow, what a powerful verse of scripture. Emphasizing the fact that Christ, when he went to the cross of Calvary, died for the ungodly. You know, who were they? Romans, the fifth, third chapter, the twenty-third verse, Paul had already established earlier. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Is there anybody here that's never sinned? Is there anybody here that I has not, did not sin this past week? Is there anybody here that can say without any uh, threat of being a liar that uh, their life is perfect? We all have sinned. And a man say he has not sinned, he is a liar, and the truth is not in him. And we agree on in the 6th chapter, the 23rd verse, where Paul writes to the Romans and says, that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The wages of sin is death. You go back to the Garden of Eden. When Adam and Eve sinned, the punishment for their sin was that they would die. You will surely die. And all of us had that death judgment placed upon us because we all have sinned. That's the need. And as you look in the world today, the need is it's just as great today as it was when Jesus died. Uh, you look what's going on in our nation. Some of the things that our law allows, and I, I'm not going to get involved with these things this morning. You, you see what's going on uh, in our political structure. And I, I think both all parties are just as wrong as, about this as uh, the other ones. We live, we're living in a sinful world. A world in which the need is just as great as it's ever been. And we need to realize that there is a need. The next area that I have, as far as my thinking is concerned, is the need. Why did Jesus have to die? I, I, I think of that. And I, I feel that the need is far greater than what we might think it is. Without Jesus Christ, we do not have forgiveness of sin. Do you realize that every time that you take communion, it's a time where you renew your spirit? If you read that passage of the scripture that I had there for communion meditation, there is a renewal of the spirit in which we renew it. And we cry out in our lives, our hearts, have mercy on me, O Lord. Let your kindness love me. I, uh, to me, my favorite book of the Old Testament happens to be Micah. And I think that the reason I like Micah so well is the way the last two verses read. Who is a God like unto you who forgives? Who forgets our trespasses? Who forgives us? You know without the death of Jesus Christ and the blood that he shed there, we would all be doomed to eternity in hell. And that's not a very pleasant, a pleasant thought to think about. As we continue to think about this, we need to realize that Jesus Christ died on Calvary not only to forgive our sins, but I think to destroy Satan. Uh, I have brother, uh, Hebrews, the second chapter, the 14th verse, in my notes. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, 
set up even, he also himself likewise took part in the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. May I call out the attention to the fact that Peter, Paul who wrote this, does not say he was destroying the works of Satan. He does that. But that he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. Jesus died not only to forgive us our sins and to shed his blood as an eternal offer to God for our, uh, our salvation. Jesus died that he might have just cause in destroying Satan. And that's based upon scripture. But one thought came to me this past week and through a conversation I had with a young man. I think Jesus died in order to be able to demonstrate the love of God to the world. For God shall love the world. He gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish that have everlasting life. Now comes to the thing I'm most important, uh, important, think what's most important. The need, the, our, our, our need, our, our, our the heed that is expressed. We need to accept Jesus Christ. We need, we need to accept him as our savior. We need to follow his commands. But I want you to listen carefully to what Paul writes in Hebrews, the second chapter, the first four verses. Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any times we would let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation which at first began to be spoken of by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him, God also bearing them with witness, both with signs and wonders and with divers miracles and the gifts of the Holy Spirit according to the, uh, own, uh, his own will. How shall we escape if we neglect this salvation? Uh, Peter writes in his gospel, uh, his, his uh, epistles, if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner be? If the righteous scarcely be saved. Uh, that, I, I think in our language today, uh, and, and make it more meaningful to us, if by the skin of our teeth we are saved. We are not saved because of the abundance of our influence. We're only saved by the grace of God. If the righteous scarcely be saved, where should the ungodly be? Revelation, the third chapter, the third verse, when the letter that Jesus sent to the church of Sardis. Remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repeat. Remember that. If thou, if therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on, the, on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. We need to realize that there is a responsibility that we have to heed the gospel message and to be faithful in that. First John, the second chapter, the 21st verse. Let us therefore abide, let, let, let that therefore abide in you that we have heard from the beginning. If that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, ye shall also continue in the Son and in the Father. How important. It is that what we have heard remains in us. 
First Corinthians, the fifteenth chapter, the second verse, by which also ye are saved, if you keep in memory which I have preached unto you, unless ye have received, believe the thing. Now, uh, uh, brothers and sisters, I, I, I realize that I'm talking to the choir. I, I, I realize your commitment and your dedication. And I'm just glad trying to lay a warning that the way this world is going, that we not be influenced by this world. How many Christians do you know that have accepted Jesus Christ and fallen by the wayside because of the lack of church attendance? I, I'm always, always reminded about uh, the preacher that was calling in a home of a family that had stopped coming to church. He was wintertime and there was an old country, country home he was visiting in. And they had a fireplace. And in that fireplace they had a fire going to be able to keep their living room warm. There were bricks on the, uh, around that fireplace because the, whenever a log would start burning it would spit out an ember once in a while that would keep the uh, house from catching on fire. As the preacher was talking to them about their church attendance, and one of these embers blew out onto that stone foundation that was there. And as the preacher talked, that ember got cool. And after so long a time, the preacher walked over and picked it up and said, I can hold this now because it's lost its heat. The devil is holding you because you have lost your heat. We need to keep on keeping on. We, we need to continue to do the things that will keep us actively involved in the work of the church. We need a Bible study. We need to get together to study the Word of God and to grow thereby. We need to be faithful in our prayers, pray without ceasing. We need to have a Christian witness. We need days of living. As I have said before in my therapy program, one of the therapists happens to be a young minister, a young man. He preaches, uh, uh, preaches and teaches up in um, West Virginia. And I don't know how many times this young man has asked me the question, what's your favorite hymn? I'm tempted when he asked me that question to answer by Jesus, saying Jesus Christ. But that's not what he was interested in. My favorite hymn happens to be Living for Jesus. There's a story behind that. And I'd like to share that story with you. I don't know whether I have in the past or not. But I was a young man in high school, way, way, way back in the mid late 40s 1940s the churches in the western Pennsylvania got, would get together every Thanksgiving and they had a winter retreat for the youth of that area and every year another church would host it if I remember right to this uh year was in down in this place of Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Conneautville. And another fellow from the church and I went together, Dave Bowman. And we got a home assignment where we were staying in the homes of one of the members. And we uh, really were enjoying the program. Dave and I were decent friends at the time, even though I had a I uh, could not communicate like I can today. At that Saturday night, as we were ending the Friday and Saturday programs at Thanksgiving time, the, we had a candlelight service in which people were invited to come to become Christians at the first time, and there were several responses to that. The young people were encouraged to rededicate their life if 
for some reason they felt they needed to, and we had several do that. But after that particular service, and after this time of uh, accepting Jesus Christ, uh, re or renewing their commitment uh, to Jesus, there was a candlelight service. The light on the communion table was a candle in the picture of Christ. Solomon's head of Christ was right behind it. And one candle was lit to represent Jesus Christ. Row by row, we went up to that communion table. Each one of us got a candle, a small candle, and from the light of the candle that represented Jesus Christ, we took a light. And then we formed a circle around the church. The church lights were off. And the more candles were lit, the brighter the light in that room, the sanctuary was. And then we had an appeal by one of the ministers about those young people that wanted to dedicate themselves to a full-time service to Jesus Christ. There were missionaries, I feel for missionaries, church secretaries, song leaders, ministers, youth ministers, but down the list of activities from the church. I felt that there was nothing I could do because of a speech impediment. And I, I, I was standing there wishing there was something I could do, but I didn't feel that I was physically, I had the ability to do it. I kid you not. As I stood there, and as the appeal was being made and the songs were being sung, the call of the young people to come up and to make a commitment, I looked down at my candle and it went out. I went to relight my candle from the fellow that was standing beside me, his candle went out. I turned to this place to light my, relight my candle and his candle. All around the room, the candles all slowly went out. And then I looked at the candle that represented Jesus Christ. And it went out. And I was convicted at that particular time that whatever God wanted me to do, I was going to do it. When I made that commitment, the lights automatically hanging, all the candles were automatically relit at the same time. I know it was mental, psychological. I know that. But the message was there. After that service is over, we were told to go to our places. Not to talk, but to think about what was done. We got to our home, Dave and I did. We had to climb a, a, a steps to get to the bedroom we were having. Dave and I didn't talk. We were trying to hold that commitment. As we entered into that home, the woman of the house looked at us, said, I have the radio on upstairs to a religious station. And all they're doing is singing hymns. We thought after the service you had tonight, you would enjoy it. We walked up the steps, walked into our bedroom, the music that was on that radio was living for Jesus. From that time on, it had been my favorite. I'm going to read three of the verses, ending with a chorus on the last verse. But listen to these words. I'm sorry, I'm all tripped up. Living for Jesus, 
a life that is true, striving to please Him in all that I do, yielding allegiance glad-hearted and free, this is the pathway of blessing for me. Living for Jesus and died in my place, bearing on Calvary my sin and disgrace. Such love constrains me to answer his call, follow his leading and give him my all. Living for Jesus through earth's little while, my dearest treasure, the light of the smile. Seeking the lost ones he died to redeem, bringing the weary to find rest in him. Now listen, of course. Oh Jesus, Lord and Savior, I give myself to thee, for thou in thy atonement didst give thyself for me. I own no other, no other master. My heart shall be thy throne. My life I give henceforth to live, O Christ, for thee alone. Stand firm in Jesus Christ, no matter what the future. We're going to be singing one verse, just as I am. We invite you to come if you have a decision. <laughs>